You're listening to the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict. So we were discussing yesterday the status of a eunuch. And we looked at various opinions about the eunuch and someone who was naturally a eunuch or perhaps a man-made eunuch. And the Mishnah is going to conclude now, the fifth Mishnah of the eighth chapter. A eunuch can't perform chalitza or yibum. That's essentially the conclusion of the Mishnah. Because the whole purpose of yibum is to create a, um, to create a, a, a descendant for a dead brother. And if the eunuch's not, if he can't do that, then the, the, essentially there's no yibum. There's no yibum at all. And so the Mishnah then goes on to say, an alienit. An alienit is someone who's congenital, congenitally incapable of having children. So this is not someone who's infertile. This is someone who doesn't have a womb. I mean, in other words, who's, who, who doesn't, who's like a eunuch, someone who doesn't have the necessary organs to have children. So, the, and her status is just like you know, v'chein ha'elionit lo cholatze v'lo mit Um She doesn't perform chalitza, and you don't perform yibum with her. So, in other words, the the whole issue about yibum and chalitza just doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. If her husband dies, and her husband is childless, then her husband's brother has no obligation. To perform yibum, and she has no need to perform chalitza. So the Mishnah then goes on to say, and the same we're going to describe now the operation with a um, with a eunuch, but the same would be true of an elonit. Hasaris shechalatz libam to lo psala. So a eunuch performs chalitza for his yivama, and there's no need to do this because we've explained already in the Mishnah. The eunuch has saris lo cholets velom yaban. He doesn't need to perform. He can't perform yibum. He doesn't need to perform chalitza. But if he goes ahead and does it, has saris shechalats the yibam tor lo psala. He doesn't disqualify her. And this means, by the way, he doesn't disqualify her from later marrying a priest. So, if you've received chalitza, if a widow receives chalitza, then or performs chalitza, she becomes as acquires a status of a divorced woman. So she can't marry a priest. But in, in this case, the chalitza has no meaning at all. It's not, it's not necessary. So there's nothing to stop. If a sarish shechalatz libam tol, if a eunuch performs chalitza of his yivama, he doesn't do anything. It's a meaningless legal act. She can go ahead and marry a priest. It's as if nothing happened at all. So far, so good. But the Mishnah goes on. But Allah, what if he had intercourse with her? It's not quite clear how the eunuch has in all. I mean, the whole idea of a eunuch having intercourse with his um, his sister-in-law isn't quite clear. But we learned. And by the way, my wife tells me that in the Ottoman period, there were two kinds of eunuchs. And some kinds of eunuchs who were most prized just had their testes cut off. So... And then they could continue to have sexual intercourse. So maybe this is what we're talking about here. But Allah, so if he did have intercourse with her, he does disqualify her from marrying a priest because this is an act of promiscuity. And not and I, the Mishnah here is not talking about an act of promiscuity just because if he's had intercourse with someone who he's not married to, but because he's he's had a sexual relationship with his brother's wife and his brother's wife is forbidden and we learned right at the beginning of the tractate that the whole question of lever at marriage is in a delicate balance because on one hand the torah prohibits prohibits a person from marrying his brother's wife and on the other hand it commands him if his brother dies childless to take on his brother's wife to raise a child so we're in this delicate delicate balance and essentially the halakha permits it, it permits someone to marry their brother's wife if yibum is necessary but it absolutely forbids them to do it in any other case 
And because, well, we've said uh, um, the, the, the eunuch doesn't perform chalitza and doesn't perform yibum, he's got no, he has no get out clause. He has no get out of jail card from the prohibition of having a sexual relationship with his brother's wife. And that's why it's an act of promiscuity. But Allah, for Salah, if he had sex with her, he's he's effectively cut her off from marrying a priest afterwards. Because it's an act of promiscuity to have a sexual relationship with your sister-in-law. And it works the same way for an Elonit. If he has... Um, where let, let, it works the same way for an Elonit. If the brothers perform Chalitza for an Elonit, they don't disqualify her because the whole act of Chalitza has no meaning for the Elonit. The Elonit is someone who can't bear children. She doesn't need to do Yibum. She doesn't need to do Chalitza. The act of Chalitza is completely meaningless. It doesn't disqualify her for a marrying a priest. But this is the mirror image, is the mirror image of the other case. But Aluha, if they had intercourse with her, they disqualify because this too is an act of promiscuity. You can't have a sexual relationship with your sister-in-law outside the framework of Yibo. And with this statement, the Mishnah is now going to is now going to segue gently from eunuchs to hermaphrodites. So the Mishnah is going to declare Saris Chama Kohen, a priest who is a natural eunuch. Saris Chama, remember we explained in the previous Mishnah, in the two Mishnayot ago, Saris Chama is someone who the son never saw in any other way, i.e. he was a eunuch from birth. Saris Hama, natural eunuch, basically. Saris Hama, Kohen. So this, this um, natural eunuch is also a Kohen. Shena Salavat Yisra. And he married. He, he married, a, 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 he married a, a Jewish girl who's not the daughter of a Kohen. So this allows her to eat Truma. Machila bi Truma. So her status, by virtue of being married to him, even though he's a eunuch, I guess the marriage can't be consummated. Even though he's a eunuch, her status is altered and she can eat from him. And then Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon go on to say, they're going to extend this from the priest who's a eunuch to a priest who's a hermaphrodite. Rabbi Yossi via Rabbi Shimon Omrim and Drogonus, Kohen, Shina Salabat Yisrael, Machilabi Truma. Similarly, it goes exactly the same way. A, a priest who is a hermaphrodite married the daughter of an Israelite, and she too can eat truma. In other words, the act of marrying that Kohen was a valid act of marriage. She comes into his house, she can eat truma. Now, we learned in the fourth chapter of Bikurim, the fourth chapter of the Tractate of First Fruits, about the um, effectively the four genders that the Mishnah recognizes and it recognizes men and women and we learned let's just go back to the mishnah in bikurim and just remind ourselves what, what the mishnah there said it's the beginning of the fourth chapter of bikurim androgynous yesh no yesh bo durachim shavel anashim but yesh bo durachim shavel anashim a hermaphrodite is in some ways like men and in some ways like women and in some ways he's like men and women and in some ways he's like neither men nor women so an, androg an androgynous, a hermaphrodite, is the best translation of androgynous. Is someone who basically has dual sexual organs. And Rabbi Yossi says, by the way, at the end of that chapter, Rabbi Yossi, Omer, androgynous, bria bifnei atzmahu velo yachlu chachamim lahachri alav. And the hermaphrodite is a unique creature. And the sages couldn't decide about it. They didn't know what he was. But aval tumtum, that is not so with a tumtum. So while 
and androgynous, and hermaphrodite is someone with both male and female organs. A tumtum is someone who doesn't seem to have any sexual organs at all. Maybe they, maybe they're they're inside. Most likely, they're inside his skin. So it's as if his testes haven't descended. His sexual organs are hidden inside his skin. So we don't quite know what gender he belongs to. That's essentially the tumtum. And the Mishnah concludes tumtum anal ken. A tumtum is is not. Is not this unique creature? Pamim shehu ish, pamim shehu isha. Sometimes he's a man, and sometimes he's a woman. So that's how the Mishnah concludes at the end of the fourth chapter of Bikurim. So let's now come back to our Mishnah. We've discussed the eunuch. We've discussed the hermaphrodite. Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon say androgynous, androgyn, androgynous, kohen, shina salavat Yisrael, machilen bitruma. Uh, a priest who's a maphrodite married the daughter of an Israelite, and this allows her to eat truma. Rabbi Yudah is gonna now, now going to add, Rabbi Yudah Omer, tumtum sheni kra venim zahar. If a tumtum was torn, so a tumtum is injured, and it, he's found to be male, so maybe he's injured and he's found to have male organs. He doesn't perform chalitza because he's like a saris. Rabbi Yudai is assuming that even though he's, he has male organs, because they haven't descended properly, effectively, he's like a eunuch. He can't use these male organs. So he has the status of a eunuch. He doesn't perform chalitza. Clearly, he's not going to perform yibum. And then we're going to quote a Mish- We're going to quote a, a halacha that we learned actually, it, it's sort of carbon copied actually from the chapter in Bikurim. Androgynous nose avol no nise. A, a hermaphrodite can marry, but can't be married. And this is something to do with the sage's view of, of marriage. I think essentially the Mishnah is saying that a man can't marry a hermaphrodite. A man can't marry her, 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 her hermaphrodite, but um, a, a hermaphrodite can marry a woman. So I guess in this state, the Mishnah seems to be suggesting that he's more like a man in this sense. And then Rabbi Eliezer is going to conclude, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer Chayavina Lavski Lak Zachar, someone's liable to be stoned on his account like a male. And this is a reference to prim- to promiscuous sex. So for which the p- punishment in the Torah is, is stoning, is skila. And so, again, I think Rabbi Eliezer is also seems to be tending to say that the androg- the hermaphrodite is a male because there's a punishment of stoning for um, promiscuous intercourse. Of course, the possibility of a real court issuing a death penalty along these lines is almost impossible to believe because for a Jewish court, a court in the time of the Mishnah, to issue a death penalty, forewarning would be required and two witnesses. And it's almost impossible to believe that promiscuous sex is going to occur in front of two witnesses after forewarning. Indeed, the Talmud records that a court which which instituted a death penalty more than once in 70 years, was considered a bloody court. Such were the restrictions on capital punishment in the time of the Talmud. But Rabbi Eliezer is someone who is taken to not just extreme views, but views that seem to be the result of taking a position to its logical extreme. Perhaps that's what we're seeing at the end of this Mishnah. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict.